Um, so this collection, um, what up, Garen? Uh, this collection was, um, there's space over here. It spans about 20 years of poems. And um, some of them I wrote when I was, you know, not yet aware of all the things I didn't know. Um, and now I know how much I don't know. So I don't come to you with any more knowledge. I just come to you with more knowledge of how much I don't know. <laughs> just so you know. Um, I don't know if any of you are aware of a, 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 a guy, a, a singer called Kenny Rogers. Mm -hmm. All right, you see, only when I'm in the Midwest, I can fucking ask that question and everybody's like, hmm. <laughs> Because when I'm in New York and the audience is younger than like 35 or even like younger than 40, they're like, ah, not really. And some of them might know who Kenny Rogers is, but then they don't really know what the fuck song he be singing. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I know I'm in a different side of the world here. Um, this one is called Know When to Fold. Do you know that song? Yes. When I was six years old, my brother was everything. Quintessential Jamaican boy, hard exterior, just like we like our boys, unforgiving, like black men are encouraged to be. I adored him. Frugal with his love as well as his money, his affections were conditional. I loved everything he did, and he loved him some Kenny Rogers. <laughs> so I loved Kenny Rogers too. For nine years, he was my only reflection, both of us brown, both abandoned by our mother, him with lighter skin, yes, straighter hair than mine. But we were similar enough to see ourselves in each other, hurt enough by the world to fiercely love each other. He loved me grudgingly. I adored him like an eager pup loves a reluctant owner. In charge of everything we did, he made me sing country music like we was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> We spent whole afternoons begging, Ruby, don't take your love to town. Singing, daytime friends and nighttime lovers. Like old drunks reliving tragic lives. But he loved the gambler most of all. Mm -hmm. You gotta know when to hold him, know when to fold him, know when to walk away. No when the run. He sang the gambler like he was Kenny Rogers himself. I couldn't understand why that boy loved that song, but I would have followed him anywhere. So just to please him, I sang the gambler with much gusto. <laughs> then our mother returned for one week, separated us, sent him to Mount Salem, left me in a place called Paradise, and disappeared. The distance between my brother and me, only two miles, might as well have been 2,000. We became single children of Sisyphus, pushing the rock of abandonment up disparate mountains. No more Kenny Rogers for us. He switched to reggae. I switched to Melissa Etheridge, Sarah McLaughlin, Michelle Endege Ocello. We both tried so hard to remain close. But our love was never meant to survive, never meant for holiday dinners and long-lasting relationships. Our life was marked for infrequent, awkward reunions laced with sorrow. We lived every day pushing against our deep desire for love, needing people but guarding against it. Such is the delicate wiring of emotional dysfunction. The few good times we had were complicated, rare, magical. Circa 1999, we found compromise in Mariah Carey, speeding 100 miles per hour on the autobahn. Windows down, we sang into the cold night. Felt so alone, <laughs> suffered through alienation, <laughs> carried the weight on my own. Happy as I was, I remember thinking, being a lesbian would one day cost me my first love, my brother, the only boy whose opinion of me ever mattered. I needed that boy to love me, but I also needed him to know me. 
So I took a chance, baited fate, and told him all about the girlish collisions I had on campus, the tacit lovers who went with me to illegal house parties in Jamaica, the pretty girls residing in the smallest closets on campus. I couldn't be silent anymore about any of them, so I told my brother everything about the boys who assaulted me, about their hands, their fingers, their fists. He listened as I talked statistics, rates at which they were killing people like me in Jamaica. Frightened and resigned to losing him, I told him I was about to be out like a motherfucker, and I told him I needed him to know me. And my almost twin, both of us discarded by our mother, both half-breeds, both seeds of my mother's ill-conceived youth. Only two years apart, my brother, who had no reason to, told me that he loved me. My Jamaican boy, raised on a stout diet of violent homophobia, said, you are my sister, so it don't matter. And I didn't quite know how to show him how lucky I felt to be his sister. I wanted to sing the gambler out loud, but the moment wasn't right, so I just tried to love him silently. I knew then that our bond would survive anything. We loved each other as hard as we could, ill-matched as siblings, witnesses to each other's pain. We developed a routine of sustainability. Whenever we disagreed about anything, he would mostly walk away, and I would mostly not let him. At each fracture, I would remind him that we were all we had, that we had survived our mother, that we could survive this, so the last time we argued, I was surprised how swiftly the tables turned. Without warning, you never see these things coming. In an instant, we became children again, forced to make tragedy out of beauty. The house of cards we constructed collapsed. Hurt and unable to find a way forward, we both folded. Bound and broken by all we had endured, we found ourselves unable to hold each other. Angry and intractable, my big brother walked away. And this time, I let him. It's painfully poetic that the contention was about our children. This irony proves everything about parenting and progeny. Generational trauma cannot be sidestepped. Today there is almost nothing but sadness between us. I know nothing of his life, he knows nothing of mine. Our childhood is now no more than a silent scream. Except for the odd memory triggered by an old playlist cartwheeling me back to us as children, unwittingly belting out our future. You gotta know when to hold, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. Yeah. This one is called Catalog the Insanity. You know when you break up and your rent is nowhere to be found, and uh, you're in some drama with some new people, and uh, you can't get along with people at work, and your fucking favorite pair of pants don't fit, and the world is just empty, and the breakup is just massive. You know, like, as you drive away from the breakup with regard to time, it starts to feel less consequential, you know what I mean? <laughs> Sometimes I'm looking behind me now, I'm wondering like, what the fuck was I doing in that relationship? The sex wasn't even that good. <laughs> you ever feel that way? It's like, what was I doing there? Like, what in God's name? But while the breakup is happening, it's like the worst fucking thing in the world. It's like, it's larger than the sun. So this is one of those moments when I just break up with somebody and I'm trying to make sense of the world. And it's like, your life is in pieces. Catalog the insanity. Catalog your insanity. Type the small words, push them from you, fingers and feet and fury first. Find the flippant denial, affirm it, bend, forget what you used to call her. Learn the name of her new lover, write it on wax paper, burn it. Forget the smell of her cunt, carry one poem to orgasm, erase the lines. Catalog the blood, drink the solution with intent. It was meant to be so, accept it. Chant the inevitable and fold her picture in three. Tear into the center of her face. Copy the broken image and send it to her. Imagine her happy, smile slitting the frame. Imagine her in Iowa, 
Cornfields bending beneath another's hand, the soft land warming her back. Catalog her leaving, admit she was never really there. Imagine her driving, haiku scattered from Denver to Kentucky to Khartoum. Construct a betrayal, make it a thing of unspeakable beauty. Forgive her, slit your wrists, survive. Count the number of times you have kissed her, multiply by three. Imagine she kisses Iowa five times more than that. Pack, unpack, pull your shoestrings together. Tighter than you need to shave your head, move to Indianapolis, buy a dog, call her impossible, call her cell phone, hang up, call again, obsess, fuck other women who remind you of her, study their scent, shower less, stare at strangers, slip in and out of reality, do not explain yourself, only survive. Sleep with a man, swallow your fist, feel. Survive, scrape the flesh from your unstable legs, abort the skeleton that stands there. Ingest one gallon of paraffin, light a match from the box she left by your bedside. Imagine her happy, then inhale. So I wrote this one when I was 25. So this is very interesting. It's called In Those Years. I love the poem, um, when I was a kid, or when I was a young human, I loved um, the poem, love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. You know, um, let us go then you and I when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half, and nobody knows the poem. You better. You know? <laughs> you know, in the evening, the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. Yeah. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. I mean, anyway, I love that poem. And I used to, you know, I was like 11 years old, like fucking muttering that poem to myself, like in a mango tree in Jamaica. Um, and, uh, you know, so when I grew up, I thought I wanted to write like the lesbian version of that poem. <laughs> so this is it. And there might not be any similarity in the poems. Just like go with me. Imagine with me. Like pretend <laughs> with my... 25-year-old self that this has some like relevance to the great poet, the great white dead poet that they all tell us that you know they're just better because they're great and they're dead and they're white. Um, but we'll talk about that afterwards. In those years, if only out of vanity, I have wondered, what kind of woman will I be when I am well past the summer of my raging youth? Will I still be raising revolutionary flags and making impassioned speeches that stir up anger in the hearts of pseudo-liberals dressed in navy blue conservative wear? In those years when I'm grateful, I still have that good, sturdy bladder. Will I be more grateful for that than any forward movement in any current political cause? Will I wish then that I had taken that job working at the bank? Or the one to watch that old lady drool all over her soft boiled eggs as she tells me how she was a raving beauty in the 60s, how she could have had any man she wanted, but she chose the one least likely to succeed. And that's why when the son of a bitch died, she had to move into this place because it was government subsidized. <laughs> Will I tell my young attendant how slender I was then and paint for her pictures of a young me more beautiful than I ever was, if only to make her forget the shriveled paper skin, the faint smell of urine that tends to linger in places built especially for revolutionaries whose causes have been won or forgotten. Will I still be lesbian then? Or will the church or family finally convince me to marry some man with a smaller dick than the one my woman uses to afford me violent and multiple orgasms? I was 25. Will the, will the staff humor my eccentricities to my face, but laugh at me in private, saying, she must have been something in her day? Most days, I don't know what I will be like then. But every day, every day I know what I want to be now. I want to be that voice that makes patriarchal preacher types so scared they hire butch black bodyguards. I want to write the poem that the New York Times cannot print because it might start some kind of black or lesbian or even a white revolution. I want to be 40 years old. I'm 47 now. I want to be 40 years old and weigh 300 pounds and ride a motorcycle in the winter time. <laughs> I want to be the girl your parents will use as a bad example of a lady. 
I want to be the dyke who likes to fuck men. I want to be the politician who never lies. I want to be that girl who never cries. I want to go down in history in a chapter marked miscellaneous because the writers could find no other way to categorize me in this world where classification is key. I want to erase the straight lines so I can be me. So I will do crossfire now. Am I a feminist or a womanist? The student needs to know if I do men occasionally and primarily, am I a lesbian? Tongue tied up in my cheek, I attempt to respond with some honesty. Well, this business of dykes and dykery, I tell her, is often messy. With social tensions as they are, you never quite know what you're getting. Girls who are only straight at night. Hardcore butches be sporting dresses between nine and six during the day. Sometimes he is a she, trapped by the limitations of our imaginations. Primarily, I tell her, I am concerned about young women who are raped on college campuses, in cars, after poetry readings like this one, in bars, bruised lip, and broken heart. You will forgive her if she doesn't come forward with the truth immediately. For when she does, it is she who will stand trial as damaged goods. Everyone will say she asked for it. Dressed as she was, she must have wanted it. The words will knock about in her head, horny, bitch, slut, tease, harlot, loose woman. Some people cannot handle a woman on the loose. You know those women in silk ties and pinstripe shirts. Those women in blood red stiletto heels and short, short, short pink skirts. These women make New York City the most interesting place. And while we're on that subject of diversity, Asia is not one big race. <laughs> and there is no such country called the islands. And no, I am not from there. There are a hundred ways to slip between the cracks of our not so credible cultural assumptions about race and religion. Like, most people are surprised that my father is Chinese. Like there's some kind of preconditioned look for the half Chinese lesbian poet who used to be Catholic, but now believes in dreams. Let's keep it real, says the boy in the double X hooded sweatshirt. That blue eyed, blonde haired, Jesus in the Vatican ain't right. That motherfucker was Jewish, not white. Christ was a Middle Eastern Rastaman who ate grapes in the company of prostitutes and drank wine more than he drank water. Born of the spirit, the disciples loved him in the flesh. But the discourse is not on those of us who clearly identify as gay or lesbian or straight. The state needs us to be a clear left or right. And those in the middle get caught in the cross. Fire away at the other side. If you are not for us, you must be against us. And I tell you something, when people get scared enough, they pick a fucking team. But be it for Buddha, or Krishna, or for Christ, I believe God is that place between belief and what you name it. I believe holy is what you do when there is nothing between your actions and your truth. The truth is, I'm afraid to draw black lines around me. I'm not always pale in the middle. I come in too many fucking flavors for one single spoon. Never one thing or the other. At night, I am everything I fear. Tears and sorrows, black windows, muffled screams. In the morning, I am all I ever wanted to be. Rain and laughter, bare footprints. Invisible scenes, always without breath, without definition. I claim every single dawn for yesterday. Yesterday is simply what I was. And tomorrow, even that will be gone. Amen. Hello. Can anybody hear me? Is it on? I don't know. Uh, here we go. Wow. 
All right, thank you so much. Um, let me just have my fangirl moment. Although, I mean, I, I, Stacey and I met when I was 19, so it's like well over a decade. No, but still, I mean, for for the baby queers at the time, I don't know if I still count as a baby queer, but for those of us, I remember being about 17 and turning on my TV and seeing Deaf Poetry Jam and seeing Stacey and come out. And I was like, there are other gay people in Jamaica, what? <laughs> And and hearing and and having this kind of um, someone who was f so fiercely visible at the time when there were few who who dared to be visible and dared to speak the truth in the way that she did. Um, so she's she's still very much an icon for all of us. You know, I, I mean, now I feel like the kind of work that Stacey Ann has done then, in many ways, has opened the door for so many people who are out now, you know, like we have all of these big name writers now, Nicole and mm -hmm. Marlon and all of these out queer Jamaicans. And, and but I, for me, like the moment of realizing that there's a world in which you can be Jamaican and gay and out and, you know, I, I feel like the world for me began when I saw Stacey on TV, you know what I mean? So let me just do my Jenny Flick <laughs> moment. Um, so, okay, I, I wanted to, to open up by talking about the title of, of this new book. So because of, of who you are and what you mean, it, it is, this is a gift, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I want to start by talking about why it took so long to give us this gift. <laughs> um, because, you know, I mean, we were trying to stalk you on YouTube and write down, I remember trying to write down the words of some of your poems um, by looking up online and on your MySpace and then you did have a website and then you came and you had a small book that you were selling at your performances and then I bought like five of them. <laughs> and, you know, so I, I, wa I want to hear about the process, the moment um, that you realize that this, this, is, this is something that you wanted to do and what took you there after s at this stage of your career. You know, um, in av every aspect of our lives, you know, homophobia and sexism and xenophobia are alive. <laughs> Uh, and so I think I was, um, I was definitely a, a person who was given space. You talk about seeing me in spaces um, like on TV or whatnot when, I mean, I, I was in my 20s then. Um, you know, I, I came here in 1997 and 2001. And 2001, I was um, on Broadway. 2002, I was on HBO. So like it, it kind of happened really, really quickly. Um, and I want to say that all those things are true in that like I think I was, I look, if, if, I, if I knew what it would cost me to do the things I did when I was in my late 20s, even early 20s in Jamaica when I came out on campus, I don't know if, if I had the foresight if I would have been able to do it. Because, you know, sometimes not knowing the future helps you to step off a ledge. Um, you know, because you're, if you knew, I mean, like, life is difficult in many ways. So if you know what the obstacles are, if you know what the costs are, you probably wouldn't take the chances. And so I was saved by not knowing how it would cost me to come out in Jamaica and cost me to be so open and so... Um, frank about who I was but I also want to say that for a long time maybe two decades maybe a decade before African-American uh, feminists um, African-American lesbians uh, Latino lesbians uh, you know Asian-American lesbians and feminists had been doing the work of pushing the LGBT community which was too white and didn't want to give up any space to people of color um, that I walked in at the very moment when the push from those women of color had reached fever pitch. And so the LGBT community, which was predominantly white uh, representing in public, they were just cracking under the pressure of that of color push, as in like, y'all motherfuckers are too white. Can you please make space for some voices of color? And uh, um, when I arrived, I was queer and black, and uh, I didn't have the I didn't have the accent that indicted white America. And so 
they made a lot more space for me than they probably would have made for a lot of the black lesbians at the time. And um, in a lot of the mainstream spaces, I was 105 pounds and I had like, you know, 32 double D boobs. So that was something that they could offer to men who wanted to look at people like me on TV mm -hmm. um, and like imagine me as a lesbian when I was young. So I just want to say that like, mm. Yes, I did hard work, and yes, there is some merit in it, but I wanted to maybe just um, illuminate the shoulders of the women mm -hmm. who had done the work to make the space open for me mm -hmm. um, when I came. So, mm -hmm. um, And then, what, as soon as I walked into the space and I started to speak out, I mean, there was so much space given to me in performance, and I, 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 was, you know, I was a bit of a sledgehammer then, um, and so, you're not, you're not, not anymore. Well, you know, now I, now I carry a scalpel in the left oh, hand. Right. <laughs> so you Refined know, some, sometimes you don't see me come in. I just reach and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, but, but I was, you know, I was, I was, I was a, a bulldozer in my youth and like, you know, I, I came with so much anger. I came with, um, the anger of being attacked in Jamaica. I came, so i I, I, I fiercely took up space. Um, in performance, so for my one-woman shows, for TV performances, for interviews, for on stage in Chicago. I mean, Chicago is the, the place where I kind of became a thing. It was in um, Chicago, um, the, the, the poetry slam, the National Poetry Slam in Chicago that year. I think there was no news going on, so every news outlet had come to the slam and I mean and I you know I was kind of like decimating all of the slams and winning everything and so I became like a thing people were like who is this girl and I had just got here so nobody knew who I was so it helped that I was kind of foreign and exotic uh but all of that space I took up in performance I felt as if it was I felt it was my right because my body like needed to stretch out and be unapologetic and I wanted to talk about my flesh and my sexuality and I wanted them to yes see me and know that yes you think I'm fly and I'm fine and you want to fuck me but yes I only want to fuck women and I only want to be fucked by women at the time uh you know remarkably uh powerful for me and empowering for me um but the written work you know I grew up in the same education system you did where um we were post-colonial right and so those dead white poets from Britain that we and some of them from America, we, the, you know, they're the gods of literature. And yeah. I studied literature in high school and I studied literature in college. And so I had a like deep respect for that work. And uh, I, I felt as if that I didn't earn the respect of that work. And then I, I went, I met Derek Walcott, who invited me to study with him mm -hmm. in Boston. Um, and so I spent like, you know, six months or so going down with him every week and like spending time with him. And, uh, you know, I remember him saying to me, you know, you have a remarkable turn of phrase. If you would just stop writing about this feminist shit and this like vagina stuff, you would be, a, a, you know, a really good writer. And, um, you know, I hadn't, hadn't realized how that affected me mm -hmm. until I kept saying, no, the poems aren't ready. The poems aren't ready. So everybody, I mean, I had had like, you know, I would say uh, uh, upwards of maybe 20 offers to publish a, 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 mm -hmm. a collection of poems. I would go to places and people were like, where I would be emailing like, you know, entire poems, like 30 pages of poems to professors who were teaching my work. Mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't publishing anything. Mm -hmm. And then when I actually sat down, I realized it's because of these men who I lauded. You know, I began by re this reading by talking about... Um, T.S. Eliot's love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, you know, I, I loved those words because they were fed to me in this education right. that I had as a kid. And it, it felt to me like, like I wasn't them. You know, they were official writers, but I was a fierce activist. I could talk about these things on stage, but to have them written in a book and have people like mm -hmm. take them seriously in mm -hmm. university classrooms... Mm -hmm. I felt as if mm -hmm. I didn't earn that right or I didn't have that right or that space wasn't open to me. Mm -hmm. um, Can I follow up with a question? Yes. Um, because you talk about that in the beginning um, of the book, right? And, and, and this is, I'll get to, the, to why I want, I said, when you do your poem, make sure you do Crossfire because I, I have a lot of, the questions I have are really centered around the ways in which you're interpolated. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that um, comes up very early in the book is that it opens with, you know, Audre Lorde, Litanist, 
um, for, survi- for survival, mm-hmm. which is what, you know, the title of the book is Crossfire, Litany for Survival. So here at the very outset, when I open the text is the black, lesbian, feminist tradition, right? And then as I read it, you start talking about Derek Walcott. And so we get into a kind of relationship, your place within a post-colonial tradition. And it feels like I want, I, I guess, listening to you talk, I want to get a sense of where is it? Because what I'm hearing you to say is that the written text is somehow granting a kind of legitimacy into mm-hmm. these traditions that you feel that somehow the embodied practice mm-hmm. perhaps um, did not. But I, I want to get a sense of where is it then that you had imagined yourself in relationship to these traditions before? And what is it about now that we have this text? Like, how do you, where do you, does this shift in some way for you, the place that you thought you occupied between these two traditions? Because the, the title of the book is Crossfire, mm. right? So to so think of you, we are caught between two things. So I'm, I'm curious as to where, now that the book out and it sell off, can everybody in this room <laughs> going to buy the book, right? Like no pressure, where, no pressure. Where, where it is that you understand this? Um, I, I don't, I mean, I, I, I'm still in struggle with that, I suppose. And that, that will always be the case, I, I believe, for people whose work is read out loud. I mean, if you, yeah, I, I am, I don't know if I'm a literary human first. If everything were suddenly right with the world, I don't know what I would write about. I would be like shiftless and without ambition. I would, you know, probably try and find me somebody who has a job so that I could have health insurance. <laughs> And I would practice the business of being a wife. I don't know. Um, (laughs) But I I feel as if, um, like, I come at this work. You know, I began, I read literature because I love it. So I was the kid, as I said, in the mango tree reading Merchant of Venice, not knowing exactly what's happening until, like, the fifth time I read it. You know, As um, we all were required you know, to but do. but I like the phrase when I was reading Macbeth, unsex me here. I didn't know what it meant, but I, I liked it. <laughs> like and it. so I would scream it, you know, whenever <laughs> if, whenever people fuck with me um on, on at school, like you know, in the eighth grade, I'd be like, Unsex me here. They're like Don't fuck with that girl, she's saying some strange shit. So I mean, like so 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 literature and how it rolls upon my tongue, you know, I mean I was one of the kids in, in church who loved to read the Bible. You know, let us go, then you and I went, you know, uh, not the, see, it's a mixing up the Bible between T.S. Eliot and the Bible, but it's, you know, by night on my bed, I, I sought him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. You know, um, the Bible is sexy, you know, a greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. I mean... Quoting it like that, yes, it's sexy. It's very, very, very sexy. I mean, like, you know, you could, you know, read, as I say, I I often tell people, like, read Song of Solomon to a lover while they're in the bath, and you're sure to get some. Um, It's absolutely like, you know, Toni Morrison or or Song of Solomon, you definitely get some. Um, But, you know, the literature of it, I love the way those words roll around in my mouth. I love the way they sound. I love the way that you can have like 15 things happening in a poetic phrase. You can have, you know, it can be red and crimson and bloody and beautiful and ugly and all at the same time. I love how that feels. And so I will always read for that beauty. But that was always like a private love. And when I came to America and I became a creature that wanted to change the world and wanted to participate in changing the world, I took up this business of using that beauty and that terror and that weight of words to try to get people to feel and try to get people to 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 grasp something else. Like like I, I don't I don't want you to just love a woman. I want for you to 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 fight for the right for for you to love your woman and for you for somebody else to love their whatever. Like, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, I, want, I always am trying to write the poem that will make people sit up and stand up and vote and protest and change the world and acknowledge everything that is wrong and push for a better world. Like, I feel deeply like, like I just want to rile up people and get them moving. You know, I don't want us to sit around and like watch the world go by. I want it to st- us to participate and I want, you know, all the ways we live to be in bright colors and deep 
sense. And, um, and I feel like that's what I want to do with the work. Um, I never just want to write a poem that exists for somebody to just read while they're taking a crap, you know, or, or to just read on a beach. I mean, if that happens, that's nice too. But I want the poem, I want my work to, to, to be like a communal charge, like a, a, a call to action. Um, you know, I, I want our humanity to be more visible and to be more connected with each other. Mm. You know, um, I want us never to forget that we are flesh and on our way somewhere else and we're on our way to spirit. Mm. And, and, and I, I don't know, I mean. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that, that makes perfect I want the sense. thing turn up. Yeah, the thing of a sell off. Yeah, say, yeah sell turn off. off. Turn up, yeah. yeah, I mean, well, it makes sense because it's, it's the ways in which you want to initiate or the kind of ways in which you want your work to be mobilized, for right? For sure, for sure. So, but then... Don't make me a good lover, but it makes me a good activist. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. All right, safe here. The sex okay. might be all right, but the relationship okay. is turbulent. And all right. After the songs of Solomon it. and everything? I know, I know. They're, they're wow, every, and the Bible some verses. Of the, some of the most and beautiful women have left me. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> On that note, no. Um... <laughs> No, but then, but, but then it, it still it returns me though to this question because you're, you're, what I hear you to be saying is that for you, the power of words is very much about, part of it is about the ways in which you can embody it in, 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 a, in a space. And the ways for in which sure, the words I, can, I create. Right, and the ways in which communally um, energy, action can be mobilized in a particular performance. Absolutely. But then absolutely. It, it doesn't answer the question though, which is then why? Where do I? What, well, why now? Well, why, why at this stage? Because them people i mean trump win yeah you need a book you need a book. have a poem in there about him so you know yeah that had to be published yeah. um and and you know written down and and the other thing is that you know i i i i saw so many people writing about bodies of color who weren't of color themselves amen um and and one of the things that always kind of like um how do i say this one of the things that that always resonates with deep sadness is how few narratives of slavery were written by the enslaved. Mm -hmm. And so... Or that what's written is always mediated by some by white voice. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I mean, like Harriet Tubman's own right. biography. Right. Like, I mean, so, so we, have this, we have this way of living, this way of being, this way of existing in the world, and we have all these stories that we are hoping to to um that they will become history mm -hmm. and we live in a time when truth is being erased and rewritten and i'm watching in one news cycle we go from one thing that we know to be true to it being an ambiguous thing 24 hours later right because we are able to manipulate truth with such completeness now because mm -hmm. of the mediums in which we work. Mm -hmm. And if we do not, I mean, I always knew it was important to tell our stories, but now I know from a historical point of view, it's important to record the stories, mm -hmm. to have them written mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. to have them, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. wh wh whatever these books will happen with these books, they will live in, in rooms and they will be discarded in piles of books under houses mm -hmm. and somebody will find them a hundred years from right. now and someone will read them right. regardless. And right. it won't be dependent on somebody else's telling of it because I wrote it exactly. down and I printed it right. and... You know, I mean, and, and I wanted to stand as testament, you know, this this 20 year period of it was a very fast period where, you know, black feminists were taking up space and were pushing for change. And, uh, you know, we have the Me Too movement. And if we didn't push back, we, it, it would have been a, an Alyssa Milano story as right. opposed to a Tarana Burke story. Right. Right. Um, so, I, I, you know, I just felt the urgency to. Right to put the damn thing down on a piece of paper right. so that it yeah. would be recorded as right. a, a record mm -hmm. of my having lived those 20 years because, you know, all them lovemaking that go on in the book, I, I want people to know that love was made right. by black yeah. women, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, on trains from Munich yeah. to Copenhagen, you know, I mean, 
people have to know that we were fucking as well as fighting, you know, and that we were laughing and that we were full of joy and that we were in struggle with each other and that we were traveling from places like Jamaica and that we were in places like Germany and we were in places like Australia. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I mean, it's gr- it, I'm glad that you talk about the, why it is that, you know, the question of authorship as it relates to these kind of formal literary traditions and so on matter. One of the things I want to, to talk some more about is precisely the ways in which, in, in hearing you say it a while ago, your relationship to Me Too, um, and the ways in which these movements, um, the kind of work that women of color um, have always done is very quickly erased the minute sure. it enters For into sure. the into the mainstream. And so I wanted to, I guess, it's a it's a double question, but I'm gonna start with the I'm gonna say point question A and then with the question mm. B. Question A is one of the things in this book is you have a kind of very clear critique of white feminism, right? Yes, Throughout yes, your yes. work, and so For I want sure. I want to hear because we talked about the black feminist lesbian tradition and crossfire the opening line of the poem is a a feminist or a womanist, womanist, right? So when you talk about crossfire, you're not just talking about your relationship to a black feminist literary tradition and a post-colonial tradition, but equally the kind of ways in which black black feminist traditions and black lesbian feminist traditions have always had to talk to white women, calling white women. It could be Audre Lorde, Letter to Mary Daly, the Mm -hmm. list goes on. So I want to hear where you understand yourself in relation to that, like how... What is your relationship to white women that we're hearing um, in the text? I think I went answer that we're reading a poem. That sounds perfect. And let me hear you. Another love story. I must sit Tsunami back. rising. In the balance of human biology, all bodies are created equal. Everybody is about 70% water, regardless of race, religion, gender, sex, or sexual orientation. We all die after about seven days without drink. But the idiots obsessed with category have decided that a double X chromosome designates me subordinate to those with an X and a Y. Intersect those two X's with the fact of my blackness and my existence is now coded as dangerous. A direct threat to the endurance of the white patriarchy. And everybody knows that white men have spent centuries appropriating what they wanted. The gold they found in Africa wasn't enough, so they packed human bodies Head to toe, submerged in a swamp of our own urine and feces, they dragged us across violent waters. Many of us drowned our young rather than let them live at the mercy of white men and their sons. Just to keep breathing, some of us became one-dimensional. In real life, in books, we had to become one thing or the other, spinster or mother, victim or virgin, damsel or whore. Some of us went underground. Some of us let go, slipping into a sunken place. Others revolted took up arms, crawled through sewage, defied geography to build new lives in new cities. And that's how I find myself in Brooklyn. I spend my nights reading tales of Nubian, Nubians bathing naked in the Nile, Kushite queens equal to kings, all of them praying to a black woman named Isis, the most powerful goddess among gods. And I imagine if I were her, if I were Isis, I would use my might to smite every motherfucker who ever looked at a little girl with lust in his flesh. I would exact vengeance on behalf of every black woman who has ever disproportionately borne the weight of racial and sexual violence while everybody in the suffragette movement and the black civil rights movement and the LGBT movement turned a blind eye to her swollen lips mouthing, me too. For centuries, black women have endured the culture of rape, and racism combined. For (coughs) centuries, the world has stood silent while black women and girls were bullied by black men and white men and white women alike. For centuries, rape was a word black mothers never spoke aloud. But every daughter knew what it meant. It meant, lie still, this will pass. It meant, keep quiet. It meant, don't you dare shame this good black family. And then one day, something brilliant happened. A black woman named Tarana Burke inspired wealthy white women to say, me too, too. And herein wriggles the strange rubric of America's particular strain of racism. Ironically, the viral mobility of the Me Too hashtag was only possible because a white woman with power retweeted a black woman.
woman's words. Two words which unleashed a wildfire of public testimony, pulling the shroud of sexual violation from the shadows, shoving it onto primetime TV. Yet 12 years after Tarana Burke's Me Too moment, black women are still largely missing from the public dialogue about sexual assault. Inside this one-sided sisterhood, black women are so tired of being disregarded. And if you white women ever gave black feminists room to speak honestly, this is the mock-up letter we might write to you whose crying consistently drowns out the sound of our own suffering. <laughs> Dear weeping white women, <laughs> even as we cannot find safe space to show you where or when or how we were torn open, we are only holding this sorrow to keep our hearts from imploding. We are unable to process our pain with you because we are exhausted from centuries of holding you and your fucking children. We have had a hard time trusting you because you have never been able to stand by us and we are so tired of explaining ourselves. If you wish to know anything else about the genesis of this rage, please motherfucking Google us. <laughs> or read Britney Cooper, or Bell Hooks, or any of the blogs of the bevy of black women writers your white publishers are too afraid to publish. For centuries, black women have been carrying the weight of your white fragility. Year after year, marching for everyone else's freedom. Simply put, this crazy mad gaggle of global witches and hags, we are done braiding beads of silent acceptance. In this century, we intend to take up more motherfucking space. Black women are now crafting a collective response to centuries of being under everybody's water. We are become a rising tsunami of fury. Come back to take back what was carried away without consent. And while we're here being fucking candid, we might as well confess to you that I don't give a fuck if you don't like my big mouth black like my lover's ass. It has never endeared me to the gatekeepers of white civility because my proclivity to speak the unspeakable is essentially the only defense I have against the indefensible violence of your man-made history. In my house, inside my Brooklyn house, there's no shadow talk of birds or bees. We trade indecipherable metaphors for concrete words that will not confuse my daughter. I tell her your mouth, your elbow, your hair, your arms, your legs, your vagina, your whole goddamn body belongs to no one but you. And if you feel even a tiny bit unsafe, you open your mouth, you scream, you tell me, and I will always believe you. In a world that so, dem so regularly demonstrates how much it hates black women, this is what it means to be assigned the label of black and girl. And yet, yet, black women continue to survive, to thrive, to arrive into adulthood with the ability to laugh and love and wear hoop earrings <laughs> and tight skirts and found social movements to liberate other motherfuckers from bondage. If any of this sounds like I'm speaking your language, this home be for you, my love. <laughs> If you have ever had to argue that you are no less deserving than your white counterpart, I am speaking to you and for you, my love. If you've ever been inspired by the magic of black women with thighs and asses that move mountains in their stride. If you've ever been told you speak too fiercely from the thick lip of your own truth. If you've ever been called girl like it was a fucking insult if you've ever been called bitch you step forward now if you are itching to light a fucking bonfire in the house of this white patriarchy you come stand with black women black women you come and stand if you want to be free like harriet tubman weapon in hand waving through unfriendly waters her power compelling the freedom of even those who did not want to be free if you desire to be confrontational like sojourner if you wish to be audacious like audrey antagonistic like Anne Gangster like Winnie Mandela, angry like Asata Shakur, you come and roar with us at our rallies. Sit beside us in schools, in church, you sing with us, stand with us where it matters. You better fucking vote with us and vote for us at these polls. Travel with us in the virtual, in the flesh, over these waters they have used against us as weapons across these lands of this rock we all call home. Let us 
Use fire to crack the ground wide open with an uprising that will never again die down. Make we dash where the water, make we use fire. No more water, we say fire next time. No more water, we go use fire next time. No more water, what? Fire, fire next time. Thanks. I don't know, academia is one of those places where I get in trouble for that poem all the time because, you know, it's largely where the weeping white woman lives. <laughs> academia. Yeah, I mean, all of these conferences where, you know, like we get angry and we're talking about the shit and then before you know it, the white woman is crying and all of a sudden we are now having to tend to the white woman's crying. Like, it's a very interesting phenomenon. We talk about it. It's uncomfortable to talk about it because a lot of the times the white women in the room have the power to write checks for what we're doing. It's just, like, so fucking complicated, which is why I'm not in academia because I, don't, I wouldn't get any funding. <laughs> I mean, but seriously, it's a very, like, interesting phenomenon. Do I tell me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Going on here. Um, so I want to think about... I want to I want to stick with the the kind of um, the notion of crossfire because I feel like reading that hearing you read that poem hearing you perform that poem um, talks about the moment the political moment that we live in right now right the urgency that we're in we're in a moment I think nationally well globally crossfire with the the plague that is upon us. The plague, um, the, the, the political, political right wing yeah. swing from like you know yeah. Canada to I'm you know to uh, Holland to yeah. Germany like right to Brazil, Brazil to yeah, yeah I mean mm -hmm. we're we're in a moment of crossfire and so I want to hear um, from you is what you think uh, what is it that poetry in this moment brings for us right like what do you see to be the power of poetry in a moment like this I think poetry has always been able what I like about poetry. I mean, I like a good story. Or I can read fiction. I can curl up with a good story anywhere and love it up and sit in it and hold it close to me. And it saved me. And I'm um, reading about like Anne of Green Gables saved me as a kid. Like David Copperfield, Great ex Expectations. I, 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 I was exposed to stories about little kids who didn't have parents and who didn't have money and still made a life for themselves. So that, that mattered to me to read these stories. Um, but the poetry it could hold all the complications of life. I feel like, you know, prose has a kind of finiteness to it. Like, you, have, you, you know, prose has to make sense. And what in the world makes sense about the president who does not want to admit that there are people with the disease because it might make him look bad, so he can't help? I mean, you heard him talk about, like, I'd rather if they stay on the ship because I like the numbers where they are as if the people don't exist until he acknowledges them. So there's this like, and, and I think that poetry holds, it can hold all of the complications of America's whiteness and our struggle to, you know, to vote democratic even though now we're down to three white men again, you know, after we Who had all these. Hmm? Three or two. It's three, is Bernie and, and Biden and Trump. One of them gonna be oh, president. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, I you know, yeah, so yeah. I mean, ho however it plays out, it's going to be one of these three yeah. men who are going to be yeah. president. So now we, you know, yet old white men again, you know, I mean, the misogyny in this country, the sexism, they wouldn't even let the, the, the white woman get it, you know, <laughs> two times. You know what I mean? The white woman is just, you know what I mean? The hierarchy is clear, you know, in here. And the one moment we had. Um, where a black man was voted in, like the backlash was so decisive that they, they, they voted in this man who was like the antithesis of everything that, you know, they wanted to make sure that we understood that, you know, white nationalism, what up, Fiesta? <laughs> you know, well, uh, you know, it's just amazing, you know, they, they had to make us that, they had to tell us that for sure, they had to put us in and make us know that whatever, whatever gains we had achieved, whatever we thought we had done, w was nothing. You know, and, and which is why I feel like poetry, because poetry, you know, it, it's the way, like even our friendships with white women, 
I have some of the most complicated relationships with some of the white women I'm friends with. And complicated in a, in a, in a necessary way because I love them and they're good friends. And, you know, they're people that, you know, well hold meaning. me down. And, you know, not just well-meaning, like good people. Mm. But the shit is so, like, ingrained in us. I know black people who are racist. You know, just like, I'm, so, so, so it's, we're all wearing it. And so we have to be, we have to be embedded in the work of doing the work all the time. Like, and you have to know that if you're going to be my friend, then we're going to call each other out all the time. The way that I, mean, I know my trans, you know, friends have to call me out about my fucking transphobia all the time because, you know, we're all in process. You know, we're all in progress. We're all in movement. And I think poetry is the kind of crazy, multi-level, multi-meaning, multi storied multi-narrative that can hold all of that you know the other, you know I, I feel like poetry is the only thing that can hold something as complicated as this mm. and it can offer a way forward and it can voice our pain mm -hmm. and it can um it, it can talk about the complicated nature of our our relationships and young people can write their own poems in their language that is theirs some of these young people when they're writing the poem I'm like what the fuck are you saying but like you know, they move in big rooms and people are like responding to it and I'm being moved by it even though I don't understand what the fuck it means all the time. And, and I imagine that, that poetry is a place where new language can live, um, where the language doesn't have to be this language of academia. Right. It doesn't have to be the language of, of, of economics. It doesn't have to be the language. Pe poetry can take on its own. I mean, uh, um, Kamar Brathwaite died. Yeah, Jesus. Just they now. Remind and, me. and Kamar Brathwaite, like, uh, nobody can twist up the fucking language and break up the words no, like Kamar like Brathwaite yeah, can. And, you know, I mean, his work to me, like, fucked with language more than Derek mm -hmm. Walcott's work. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But, I mean, all of that to say that the, 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 the ickiness of, you know, poetry is like sex. It's just messy. And the better it is, is the messier it is. Nobody have that experience? <laughs> I mean, whatever, you know, we're here. We, we, I fucks with you. Um, it's so funny that, and I, so I want to open it up to, to questions. To room, yeah. yeah, I want to hear, you know, on that note, if you'd like to share your experiences of poetry and sex, feel free to bring it here. Should I have been saying I'm um, fucking all that on this? Yeah, cameras? you can. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. We're good. We're good. You said all you needed to bleep, say. Bleep, bleep, sorry. You said all you needed to say. I, okay. I want to. Questions, comments, open up the space, talk to each other. Go, you, no? No. Thanks for the thumbs up. I appreciate it. Try hard. No, nobody wants I mean, I, I, I can ask another question. Oh, here we go, go. Or we can eat some Mexican food. I don't food. necessarily have, well, yes, it's a lot of things. But uh, Stacey and you, we know, we know. I love you. I, I love you. And uh, this room right now, the people that are in it just reminds me of so many spaces we share. Um, one of the things that I've always thought about your work in books is that I understand the necessity of a book, but any and every time I've encountered you as a poet, um, it's very clear to me that you are representative of how, how, how much it takes the body to communicate mm -hmm. that language is such a physical thing mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and you know even with the the, the the banter right before the performance about where you may end up right? <laughs> the cameraman right is 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 because that thing has is what it's supposed to do Mm -hmm. Right, but then there's that thing in you that that is trying to that needs to do, or not mm -hmm. need, but it's going to do mm -hmm. what it's going to do. Um, Which is why this coronavirus is fucking with me because I need people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, look. Curtis Mayfield says there's a hell of a love. Y'all know. 
We ain't worried about that. We've been to them things. And um, can you really speak to just the body? The body. Mm-hmm. I mean, those of us who are nearing 50 know that this body is just, you know, I don't, why y'all old people didn't tell us we were going to age? <laughs> For all the young people in the room, I've made it my duty to tell you, know, that like particular things are going to happen to you, like your pubes are going to go gray. You ain't know this yet, but I want to tell you. Yes! Uh, you know, I mean, maybe I wouldn't believe it, but at least I would have it on my, do you know what I mean? And I, and I hear that not only the pubes go gray, but they fall out. Oh, I know. Really? That's, I haven't, it hasn't happened to me yet, but I hear it coming. Oh, so you lose all I know, the, lose I know. So you happily plucking away now. One day you'll tell people, look, it used to be so fluffy. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, <laughs> one of the beautiful things about the flesh, though, is that it is impermanent and that it changes. And so I can't imagine living in the same body I was living in when I was 25 now because there is so much, I don't know, like the things I admired about my grandmother, you know, she died 94, but then when, when I asked her a question, she would go, wait, I think, no man, I think, I think it was, I think it was raining. No, it was the year before, because the year before, your brother born two years before, October, right? Oh, yes, that October. No, it was raining that October. You know, it was very sunny. It was warmer than it should have been. And before you know it, we are now 10 years beyond what I've asked her for. <laughs> and 15 hours into another story, and I'm getting schooled on the whole history. And just the way she told a story, you know, like, she had a big bum, and she would just... She would just settle in and take up the space. Uh, and you know, and, and, and uh, what I've noticed for, uh, for black people everywhere, for black people in, in Rotterdam, for black people in South Africa, for black people in Swaziland, black people in, in, in Kingston, black people in um, St. Lucia, like black people in the South. I don't know why we can't fucking just talk. Your whole body must be involved in the talk. Like, I ain't no. Mm -mm, mm -mm. It's like all you know, from the young to the like. No, no. You know, even even when the pursing of the list, what, the disapproval is like. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Even when even when they say they're not saying anything, I'm not saying a word. <laughs> <laughs> So much is embedded in the body. There's a way that um, our very being is a kind of theater. People talk about, oh, we, we, we are performers. No, motherfucker, you took the shit that we do normal and you say is performance. But we just do it. This is how we be. You know what I mean? Our legs, our arms, our back, our bodies, you know, everything about it is very, like, present. Like... I'm always aware of my grandmother's knee. You know, she must know, oh Lord, yes. And she must tell you the story about the knee and it must be like a whole thing. And I watch my kid who is eight years old fly around and like kick her body up. And like, it's just the flesh of it is just must be present. And I don't know any other way to be. And you know, if I feel like I can't use my hands and I can't use, which is why the mic must always be on a stand because I can't hold the mic because then I, I'm locked into this position. So I must then... I must have my arms going. Even the book here, I have to hold on to the book where I usually have papers where my arms are flying left, right, and center. Um, I don't know. There's, there's something in... And, and I don't know if it has to do with like the survival that we have had to do, but I just know that like everything we are must be present in almost every moment that we do. <laughs> and... Um, and I think that's sexy, you know? I like to watch a black woman walk across the room because I think there's like a history in it because I can see the movement from Africa to, you know, the Americas, to the Caribbean in it. There's the way that she moves that I imagine that, you know, I can see her whole history in that stride. Um, I, don't, I, I don't quite know how to, there's no, I, I don't know if I can make any kind of intellectual sense of it 
but I just you know. Just did, you just did. Yeah, 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 I just know that I, yeah. you know, my whole body must be zinging. Like this morning when I thought I had coronavirus. <laughs> because, you know, the shit is just crazy. Like, it's, it's on the news. So this morning I was convinced. So I'm like on the floor, my heart is palpitating. I'm watching my heart jump out of my left tit. I'm like, you know, shaking, my hands are shaking, and like my armpits sweating, like my, I swear, like, yes, I have, I feel a tightness in my chest, I know that I have pneumonia, I must call, so, but I'm afraid to call Emily and say that I think I have the coronavirus, because, uh, but you know, like, it's the way that, like, how our thoughts enter our bodies, and it makes our bodies start the weird things, but then when somebody called me and started telling me somebody else's business, I forget that I have the coronavirus, I, <laughs> All the symptoms are gone, you know what I mean? Because my body follows my mind, you know? <laughs> what time are we? Are we up are we for time? No, no, no. Oh, question. Oh, question. Um, so, uh, you have just this fierce way of being willing to tell the truth. And I wonder. Um, as you talk about the arc of the journey that you've taken, that part of what opened doors for you when you came here was that you were willing to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And that this was something that was um, attractive to mm -hmm. people. Um, but sometimes um, it is also um, requires you to be very brave um, in order to be willing to do that. And I wonder, in your journey of being willing to tell the truth, um, at 47 versus at 25, um, does it get easier? Is, or is it, is it that thing that um, just allows you to keep breathing? I think it's a bit of both. You know, like um, my grandmother, but when she was 94, whenever she needed to fart, she would not, she would just be in the middle of telling me a story like, yeah, I think Neville was here the other day. And, uh, and um, he was, he, I, there would be no acknowledgement of it. So I feel like she, she lived to the point where she gave no fucks. You know what I mean? Like she was like, I am willing to fart and here comes the fart and I don't need to give you. You know what a fart is. I know what a fart is. There's no need to have a conversation about it. Um, I think that there's some of that that happens as you age where you're like, okay, I have nothing left. to. And, and I also have been practicing this for so long that people, I have the, I have the good luck of people, um, the good fortune of people expecting it from me. So I get a lot more space maybe than the average beer. But it also costs a lot more, I think. Um, you know, I, I, don't think I, I, I'm, I don't think I'm invited in many spaces because they just can't. You know, they don't know what I'm going to say because I also don't know what I'm going to say. Um, so when people ask me all the time, like, what are you going to read? I'm like, I don't know. You know, I, I decide whenever I'm... Do you need to know what we're going to talk about? Yeah. You know? My first question. Yes. Yeah. Should, should we go th over my questions? You're like, no. no. <laughs> yeah, because Thanks. because I want the conversation to be organic and I want it to be honest. And I think that if I make up my answer beforehand, then I start to filter through whether the whether the answer is a good answer, and then I start you shaping it. Yeah. Whereas I have to now respond to the question as I hear it and mm. kind of come to terms with an answer. Um, but you know, I was a liar up until I was 15. If you've read The Other Side of Paradise, you know, I told so many lies because life at home was so shitty that I wanted other people to think that life was better, and so I lied a lot. But then I went to college at 16, and I was like, I, don't, I remember the moment when I decided that I cannot keep track of who I tell what because you can't tell the same story because different people are in different proximity to your truth, and so you can't tell everybody the same lie unless like, you're a stranger to everybody. And I got tired of keeping track of the lies, and so I was like... When a girl said to me, so, you know, why did you choose this college? And I was like, well, my mother left me when I was a baby and my father didn't claim me. And then um, I don't have any money. And so I'm here on scholarship. And, you know, if I fail one class, they're going to kick me out. So, yeah. And she was like, OK. <laughs> um, but, you know, I never turned back after that. Like, I was, I was always like a teller of my. And also, it comes from like being like an, an abandoned kid where nobody's looking at you. And so you always want to tell me. Because you need attention and love as a kid, you know. So I've started that practice of being an outspoken kid because I was trying to get people to love me and see me mm. when I was a child. And um, thank God, like, it just didn't end there. It, you know, I met people like the work of Audre Lorde and the work of June Jordan and, you know, Jackie Anderson. And I met, you know, Howard Zinn mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, people who 
you know, Ruby, Ruby Nell Sales, who deeply, um, you know, encouraged the telling of truth and mentored me into telling a truth that was mine. Um, and, you know, I, I look, I'm looking at um, Theasta because we've not been in Chicago together for eons. Years and years and years ago, I came here and I was like, I, I was breaking up with some woman or other, like deeply sorrowful and like, you know, just licking my tiles in the, in the hotel. And Theasta called me up and said, you know what you need? I'm taking you somewhere. And he, I got in the car and he took me out to somewhere to like make pottery. <laughs> you know, I mean, and I was out there in the middle of fucking nowhere in like a barn or some fucking <laughs> shit like that to make pottery with, uh, with Theasta. I mean, like, I have been... I've, I've been lucky. I've been lucky enough to like have like amazing, amazing experiences. I mean, I look through the room, and you know, Danielle, I've known for 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 decades. I mean, even though you're really, you know, a baby, and you know, I, I I've known um, Nina Nina J right here, who's a, a poet, like uh, you know extraordinary if you, if you don't know her work you should find it Emily I've known for two decades as well I knew you when your baby was your first baby was like a baby I was changing diapers <laughs> so this is a, a beautiful room like Chicago you know Avery our young I've known you like you know you've made me laugh in so many cities I mean <laughs> I love being here in Chicago when the room get this tight and small and intimate and I can't wait to go and eat food over there and then talk afterwards <laughs> Um, Jump yes. in, yeah. Yes. Have you ever gotten the? Have you ever gotten like in my school? Some people call some girls gay when they're actually sometimes lesbian. Mm -hmm. I feel so mad. I want to slap that person. Oh. <laughs> really? Right. I, I always go to them. I'm like, Are you sure that's the right word? I'm sure the word you're looking for is lesbian. Because if you say they're gay, you technically call them straight. I hope you've realized that. How well, how so? Because gay technically means you like a boy. And if you call a girl that. Ah, <laughs> oh, I see, I see, I see. You see, this is where we, this is where you and I need to be in room so we can like really talk about this shit because, I, you know, that's like so far into me. Like we were like, I'm gay, you know. Um, but I remember being, I remember being a, a young lesbian and hearing the older lesbians, we were like, I'm a dyke. And these older lesbians like, don't call me a dyke. Don't you dare call me a dyke. And we were like, no, I'm a dyke. So I think, you know, the words will change with each generation. And that's great. And that's good because it pushes us to think about the phenomenon in different ways. Mm -hmm. But at the heart of it is I feel like I like the idea that you're standing up for, you know, um, for the dignity of people you think who need to be called a certain thing. Mm -hmm. That's amazing and wonderful in itself. And you should have more conversations with people. You should like maybe get together with some of those people who have those experiences and like have a, a talk through. And you'll find that you probably have more in common than you do not. Mm -hmm. You know, because language changes. You know, what I mean, mm -hmm. like it's different. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. and 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 twenty years from now, my daughter who's eight is gonna be saying to you like, "Don't say that shit to me." <laughs> You know, the first, the first like wave of lesbians were like, I'm a lesbian, I'm a lesbian separatist. And the wave came afterwards and we're like, well, we're just trying to like get married and have children and like fit in with the world. And then the other group is like, you know what? Fuck away with all this gender. I'm nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, you know, I'm fluid or whatever. And then like, I don't know what the other kids are going to come up with, but it's going to change. Mm -hmm. And you have to be okay with like each generation twisting it up. Mm -hmm. Um, but I like that you're engaged, mm -hmm. and I'm happy to see you're so engaged that you're out to just throw your truth out in a room full of people. I hope you know it feels good for the people to hear you, and to hear your voice, and um, and to, to to be in a room and like move people and make them a little uncomfortable with your question. You should keep doing it. <laughs> so I would like to thank Danielle and Stacey.